Good morning and a warm welcome to day two of this incredible gathering both here in the room in London at the Building Center but also to our audiences joining online as well. Um, for those of you that I didn't meet yesterday, my name is Bindi Vora. I'm the senior curator at Autograph in London. Since Autograph's founding in 1988, voices around rights, representation, and the politics of identity have remained as a mandate for the organization. As we consider the trajectories of conversations that have occurred with the artists, writers, and thinkers that we've had both the pleasure and privilege of working with, they continue to raise many crucial questions that amplify the converging histories and contemporary realities. Ultimately, these ways of navigating lived experiences create a canvas for the evolving discourses. What we learn is that change can be slow and it oscillates as the context around change evolves. The conference, Extractivism, Activism, Art, Activism and Ecology, Extraction, <laughs> looks at the intersections of what an active practice can aid in reevaluating the relationship between the arts, extraction and activism, both historically and in the present. For Autograph, convening this gathering with our colleague Shriya Chatterjee at the Paul Mellon Center has offered us all a way to consider how the futurity of ideas can manifest in an act, as an active space. One of the critical questions that Autograph's director Mark Seeley raised at the very beginning was how do all of these conversations and dialogue work towards new formations and new legal possibilities in the politics of change? Dialogue shared yesterday, and I'm sure will continue today throughout our sessions, have been so generous. The voices and experiences, each acute in their own geographies and context, but traverse across time, space, and place. Yesterday, I began making notations of the forms of actions that were, that were described. Acts of extraction, acts of survival, acts of reclamation, acts of resistance, acts of resilience, acts of protest, acts of liberation, acts of displacement, acts of colonialism, acts of collaboration, acts of both learning and unlearning, and acts of tension. All of these infinite actions speak to this active practice that constantly adapts to the multiplicities um, of context and considers how the precarity of infrastructure in relation to the distribution of resource, health, access to forms of care, and the remedial work that persists are shared or considered. But it also reminds us of the knowledge that has become lost in these exploitative structures where lived experiences have been dismissed. The current season of exhibitions at Autograph mark the culmination of conversations generated over the last decade. Wolfred Uppung, Future Cosmos, Niger Delta, emotively contemplates the lasting legacies of oil extraction in the Niger Delta. And Monica Alcazar Duarte, Digital Clouds Don't Carry Rain, seeks to affirm the value of her Mexican indigenous heritage through the amplification of erased knowledge, examining Western society's obsession with speed, expansion, and resource accumulation at a time when ecological, ecological disaster looms. As we consider these positionalities as frameworks or interventions that sit at the intersection of art and information, we are encouraged to look deeper and more closely. This evening, for those of you joining us in person, you will have the opportunity to visit Autograph. And although the galleries remain open till 9 p.m. this evening, we have arranged for one of our um, very knowledgeable visitor ambassadors to give you all a short um, introduction to the exhibitions promptly at 6.30. So if you're Later, it will be self-led. Um, for further information about where Autograph is located, for those of you that are joining, please visit our website, autograph.org.uk. And for those of you online, my colleague Kathleen is about to put the VR link for the exhibitions into the chat box. So those of you not with us, you can still experience the exhibitions. I would like to extend my thanks to my colleagues, Lois, Mendy, Jaya, Harriet, and Joe Lee at Autograph, as well as Kathleen Eller and Rebecca at the Paul Mellon Center, who have been so invaluable to the coordination and organization of the symposium. The conference is, is divided into sessions that are about one to two hours long, with short breaks in between, for people to stretch their legs, get teas and coffees here at the building center, and of course, in your homes and offices at home, for those of you online. Um, Luckily, for those of you in person, lunch is provided and will be served upstairs where the teas and coffees were just now. And as you'll see on the program, the talks are all quite short and are meant to spark conversations. We will have time for questions and we ask our online audiences to type their questions into the Q&A box. And my colleague Rebecca will try and read them all out. 
those of us in the room, raise your hands and we'll do it the old-fashioned way. So, without further ado, I would like to welcome Ravi Agarwal, who will be chairing the first panel, Forest Rights. Thank you very much. Good morning and thank you, uh, Shriya, Bindi and Mark, for uh, an, an, the second day of the fantastic uh, conversation we have been having, having since yesterday. Uh, for the forest rights uh, panel now, uh, we have three uh, esteemed panelists, but I'm going to just, before reading out their bios, I'm going to just ha have a short statement to locate the panel. Uh, the colonial histories of forests continue to shape the overall question of nature deeply. Forest lands are under constant contestations. Even though there are particular histories in different geographies around the world, Overall, forests have been shaped by race, caste, resource use, capital, and state power, often overriding rights of indigenous dwellers. In, for example, in pre-independence India, starting from the first imperial forest laws in 1957, forests have been fenced and forest dwellers evicted. In fact, the Imperial Forest Service of the British Empire was created based on early institutional experiments in India in the mid-19th century uh, for the so-called scientific management of forests. More recently, the Indian Forest Rights Act of 2006, which technically gave rights to forest dwellers, only came after a long people's movement, but it is still in play and constantly being diluted or not fully implemented. Forest dwellers' relationships with forest bureaucracies often are those of rulers and the ruled, as con consultations with them are rare or perfunctory, and their own coexistence-based relationships with the forest or the knowledge of the forest largely ignored or not understood. The debates about forests are contentious and vexed, pitching people against forests rather than forest dwellers as guardians or considered original inheritors. These have only become more so in times of climate change where forests are treated as, treated as carbon sinks. In all these farming, all these framings, forests are meant to serve a human purpose for land, control, financialization, resource use, tourism, etc. But the question of rights of forests have, however, not been on the main agenda. With that, I'd like to introduce uh, uh, the two presentations. The first presentation is a joint presentation uh, by Elias Kimayo and Eline Benjaminsen. I hope I've got the names pronounced correctly. Uh, Elias Kimayo uh, is a from Kenya is a Sengwa indigenous community leader from Embobut Forest. He is also a land and human rights defender, as well as a community journalist. Together with other community leaders, he lobbies for ancestral and tenure rights and recognition. He works closely with community allies like civil societies, journalists, researchers, and paralegals to raise awareness about the violence that is taking place towards his people as a consequence of neoliberal conservation. In 2017, he was declared Human Rights Defender of the Year by Defenders Coalition. Uh, uh, Ellen uh, Benjaminson uh, from Norway deals with the challenge of perceiving market processes through photographic follow the money narratives that combine prints, video, and text in mixed media installations. Concerned by how the, how the lacking visuality of socioeconomic processes affects our ability to engage with them, she investigates the potentiality it's in imagery to enable us to observe such processes clearer. Collaboration plays a central role in all her projects, and she works closely with a variety of platforms and individuals, from research, researchers and activists to the financial press. Uh, the second presentation will be by uh, Rahul Ranjan, uh, who's a lecturer, uh, uh, assistant professor in the environmental and climate justice uh, at the Department of Geography School of Geosciences, University of Edinburgh, Scotland. Over the decade, he has ethnographically worked on the long-standing conflict between social movements, indigenous people's struggles, and extraction politics in India. Recently, he also has also undertaken ethnographic fieldworks in the Western Himalayas and conducted a short pilot study and consultation work in Ayotthya, Ayotthya, New Zealand, exploring contours of river rights and community mobilization. I would like to welcome uh, Ellis and Eileen for their first presentation, please. Thank you. 
First of all, thank you so much for having us. We're really delighted to be here. Uh, it's been a really nice program. Um, we'll talk about our ongoing project, Footprints in the Valley, uh, which looks at the neoliberal and colonial stammerings within militarized and fortress conservation, surrealisms uh, of global carbon offsetting schemes, um, financialization of ecosystem services uh, and its ultimate violence, violent consequences for many uh, indigenous people uh, globally, amongst them Sengwar people living in Embobut, uh, for which Elias here is a member. Uh, Elias will speak about Sengwar land rights struggle at the hands of the Kenyan Forest Service, funded by various conservation funds eager to make Embobut forest facilitate a carbon market. Uh, and how he started documenting these violations about 10 years ago and to what effect. And we will both be gi giving some context to these strange markets and the various aims of the project and the different ways in which we are looking at the treescapes um, and the different landscapes of Embobut. Uh, so the last year I've been very preoccupied with this strange space between market fundamentalism and where this meets uh, climatic collapse. And this project in particular started uh, with, it was, it was spurred by this document that I received after purchasing a so-called carbon credit or offset um, from a London-based broker actually in 2018. That says that one tree in the Great Rift Valley in Kenya uh, will compensate one ton of my carbon uh, emissions. And this hit me as, as, as a quite uh, surrealist claim. Uh, not only that one tree equals, or one credit equals exactly one tree that also equals one ton uh, of speculatively and already emitted uh, ton of carbon uh, that also of course is emitted on the other side of the planet. Uh, but I also got curious about uh, to which extent, which extent uh, this tree actually existed uh, and then in what, which context. So through this curiosity, I got to know Elias, uh, who will now tell you about how these types of market-based conservation schemes affects his community. Okay, thanks, Elias. Um, hmm. Actually, uh, Sengwer land rights struggle did not start today. It started when, yeah, yeah, it started when, yeah, it started when colonies or British colonies made Kenya a third colony. So that was in 18. I don't think it's working. I think you need to. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think our land rights struggle did not start today. It started when colonies, uh, British colonies, met a protectorate colony in Kenya in, in 1895. So they came to Kenya and divided our land into two sections, one to settle white settler farms and another one a protected area. So all those lands we used sustainably in the first place. Then now, at the moment, the protected area is being met a commodity for carbon credits. That means they kick people out of the land in order to invest into carbon markets. There's, and another thing is that uh, the conservation, whenever they, what facilitates that is that they, they get con conservation donor agencies put money into into conservation areas, for example, World Bank, Finnish, uh, World Bank, UNDP, and uh, recently EU, they they pay money for conservation projects that is unsustainable. That kicks people out of the the forest by use of a forest cards. That is Kenya Forest Service. Second thing that facilitates as well is. Uh, formulation of national laws. This national laws doesn't recognize indigenous communities to live inside protected areas. They wanted to like separate communities from nature that have lived for many centuries. Another act also is uh, wildlife like act. Sengwari Indigenous communities are 
Anders and Kataras, but now they met that act in order to criminalize uh, their way, their livelihood. So again, as we move on, going now to real carbon markets is when, for example, in 2023, last year, the uh, Kenya government hosted the African Climate Summit that was held in Nairobi, and uh, that African Climate Summit created an African carbon market whereby they, they invited uh, people like uh, Arab Emirates through Blue, Car uh, Blue Carbon, whereby it's rumored that they have bought a large chunk of land in, in Kenya, not only Kenya, but Eastern Central Africa to invest on these carbon markets which then ended to kick up communities out of their lands. So I've been doing this work, uh, like my work was when we were kicked out of the forest, was to take a camera and document in order to show outside the world what this conservation fund does to communities and their ecosystems. And uh, in... To 2017, I was almost eliminated. Being I, I, I still suffered the injuries of uh, brutal post by Kenya Forest Service because from 2015, 2016, 2017 is when they knew now that there is a person who, who takes photos and videos and shows them what they are doing in their forest because actually they close to their forest. They don't allow anyone, any, any journalist or anyone so that to get peaceful way of kicking out the people who are the custodians. Uh, now, as we met with Eileen and uh, with this work complementing with mine, we started now documenting uh, evidences, like put it in chronological order to show history dating back, because if you go into the forest, you get houses that were abandoned around 1980s, we just peel them and put them in chronological order to, to date, so that we can use those photos, actually to look for platforms to show uh, the effects of conservation projects or conservation funds, so that to show these people their tax site of conservation funds that how they affect the communities as well as the ecosystems because it's not sustainable. I, yeah, and uh, another thing. So by doing so, uh, yeah, by after this and then we have like, we have our ways of sustainable forest conservation whereby we have there is a way we use to live and have our forest live with almond with our trees. And uh, for example, the banded uh, trees that we use, there is cuts of trees whereby we we, we use those uh, trees sustainable. For example, we get juices for medicinal value, we hang our pipes and uh, things like those. We'll come back to that. Uh, okay, so yeah, so this project is twofold. Um, to dwell on this, uh, to dwell and make comprehensive the abstract, thank you, uh, and speculative market that is the offsetting market at the time when it is even after decades of failure uh, and countless controversies being implemented actually at an increasing level worldwide. And on the other side, the project has an ambition to function as a collection of proof, uh, like the Kenyan Forest Service is claiming that they have not been burning houses and evicting people brutally, yet Amberwood is covered in the remnants of houses they have burnt uh, dating back to the late 80s. Let's see. And a central uh, example of a controversy uh, relating to offsetting markets is uh, the Red Plus uh, projects, uh, which we don't have time to go into uh, very deeply, but uh, that has been tried, implemented in Embobut uh, with funds uh, from the World Bank, and which my country of origin, Norway, is the largest funder of globally, and where our previous state minister has specifically announced that there is an aim 
to, through this funding, secure carbon offsets for the state of Norway, and which has been shown to dispossess many forest communities globally, and of course, have been a threat to ecosystems due to these kinds of violent practices. Uh, so through different uh, various modes of imaging, uh, we measured the landscapes of Embubut, uh, considering it through the lenses of different value sets, uh, testing different logics, visibilities and perspectives uh, from a market and ecosystem services perspective that counts carbon credits uh, and from the perspective of the livelihoods of Sengor inhabitants. Uh, for example, individual trees are observed through digital rendering, alluding to or playing with this imagery, imaging processes and aesthetics that are used for measuring forest uh, carbon stock, experimenting with the imaginings of how the market renders or captures trees, uh, these individual trees as financialized commodities in a marketplace, uh, distinguished from their land and cultural meanings. Uh, for communities. And then, of course, we have the photographs that Elias just talked about uh, that I think uh, kind of both very quietly and loudly at once are insisting on how these seemingly distinct processes are, in fact, interchangeably linked. Um, yeah, to mention an anecdote about KFS, the Kenyan Forest Service and imagery, uh, they are very aware of, you know, they, they want to, they have even admitted to us that they are uh, wanting to really control these, uh, the images that uh, come out of Mbubut. Uh When I was there now in last, last February, um, they, we were unlucky to meet them uh, and they didn't let us uh, enter the forest. Uh, and one reason that they mentioned for this was because the images that we might make could be used as proof in ongoing lawsuits that the Sengwer, Sengwer have raised against them. So this is definitely something that they are aware of and want to control. Uh, and they also have offered uh, us a certificate in order to make imagery. Uh, so you can, you can pay to make this footage apparently. Uh, yeah. yeah. So nowadays we are editing material uh, that we made uh, last month in February, uh, which is aiming to become a narrated film. Um, and meanwhile, uh, Elias will continue to photograph the remnants of burnt houses, uh, which we think should become a publication of some sort in the future that we can use to map out this history of militarized and fortress and financialized nature schemes and their impact in Ambubut um, to really make a kind of chronology of funds against the waves of uh, violent evictions through, yeah, since the 80s. Um, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, I think these are some of the trees KFS are just trying to cut us out of the forest in order to for, in order to get investment for carbon credits. As you can see, if there is emissions, yeah, if there are emissions, then these trees are tired of those emissions from global north countries trying to. Uh, emit into an environment and their trees are just tight as you can see. So you're just skipping over. Yeah. 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 yeah, and also as I mentioned earlier, this is sustainable way of how we use trees. For the old tree, we used it to hoist our beehives. Uh, so we, we get also like packs for making our tea. Uh, and also we get some packs and roots for medicinal value and uh, we still live with trees and then the tree still survives and like like where they cut the old tree in order to exploit. Yeah. That is it.
Uh, yeah, so, uh, yeah, so just to finish, um, so this project is uh, obviously still evolving and we're very much looking and thinking about uh, different spaces and platforms that will be relevant. So if anyone has suggestions, we're all ears. First of all, thank you, Shreya, Autograph, Ella, Kathleen, and everyone involved in setting this up and putting so much of work that it takes to get people together. Um, so thank you so much. I feel very privileged uh, to be speaking today. Um, my presentation um, is an outcome of a book that I just published, but it's also trying to move away from it in many ways. Um, and through my presentation, I make a key argument, which is that often when we think of forest, um, we are guided by this dual understanding between nature and culture. So my project is making an, a, an attempt to dismantle that fragmented understanding between people who dwell within the forest um, and the kind of method we use from outside to assess it. Um, and I do that by using um, a case study of an anti-colonial hero from late 19th century India who fought against British Empire. Um, and through his movement, he successfully delivered how, um, so far as we're going to treat forests as sites of resource production, we're going to be in conflict with indigenous community. And I'll stick to my presentation so I'm coherent. <laughs> Holocene is here to stay, they said. Last week, on a Friday email at my department in geosciences at Edinburgh, we learned that after 15 years of discussion on exploration, the idea of Anthropocene, the geological epoch in which humans are constantly changing the entire ecology will no more be agreed upon as an official epoch to define Earth's geological timeline. But we do know that whether or not we agree with the definition, the bearing of ecological extraction, the colonial ecological extraction, continues to define the degradation, which is not only limited to the landscape, but also its quotidian human and non-human. And for each section, I'll read a quote. I'll read a quote from an archive of late 19th century, often documented and noted by British officials who were deployed in these forests. And then I'll provide an explanation to that. So in 1897, H.C. Streetfield writes, and I quote, the whole basis for the movement led by this uh, indigenous person that I study is a feeling on the part that Mundas, the tribe, they are the true owners of the forest, the soil, the water, that they appointed the Maharaja, the king, and all that non-aboriginals are interlopers and land grabbers. To this I must add to the fact on which I have more than dwelt that these Mundas, the indigenous people, is altogether incapable of making good case for himself either in the court of law and otherwise. While these people always beset of his, uh, and his leader by his own race and outsider, ready to swindle him out of his land and all of his other rights. Their cry, the cry of the indigenous people here, is same as that of old agrarian movement. That is, the Raj, the British Raj, is there and not ours, and that they intend to fight for it, and they say they will get it." Unquote. In 20... 19, while I was doing fieldwork in the eastern state of Jharkhand in India, and that's on the right side is the photograph of the rebellion that I study in my book project and the installation of some of the missionary church which was founded in 19th century. In 2019, one of the front leading um, anti-extraction indigenous activists um, quoted saying, and I quote her, at that time, colonial India, when Birsa Munda, the the cannon fought against the empire. We then had one East India Company. Today, we are an independent India, the post-colonial India. You must study at your university, or you must be told. Now, 18 years into this new state where she's based now, there is an attack on, from all quarters. The East India Company, against which Birsa, this cannon, 
rose to seek independence for jal jungle or jameen water forest and land we are in an independent area there is an attack now from all quarters again there was one east india at least to fight against then now we have many at home unquote by 19th century the practice of burial i will move to show how the duality between the forest and the people who dwell within it doesn't really hold by the 19th century the practice of burial emerged as a testimony to historical claims of belonging frequently used as evidence within colonial encounters the indigenous people in the eastern india made it clear that the burial custom for legal process must be recognized one of the officers then uh, in this area who was in charge of uh, looking over the land title deeds which are the uh, titles that were given to different people made sure that the evidence are accurate and fact checked once legal consideration of the burial as a form of claims had been established these grounds were further entrenched in order to testify the truth in short the support of community members and their historical roots were required in order to approve whether a burial is an authentic claim of territory or not i can't help myself asking but what would be the verifiable truth if the truth is memory of a community often it was determined by a common denomination every kili which is a small title of land should have its own burial and i quote another missionary who's whose work has been prolific in terms of helping some of the post colonial historians to reconstruct the narrative of forest extraction that happened and continues to happen in east india and i quote him to these burial slabs to these burial slabs therefore the highest evidential values attaches hence it is that when in comparatively recent time written and registered document came into use as title deeds to prove the proprietary and other interest in land the mundari the indigenous people summed up their view in matter saying their burial stones are the title deeds of their race their ancestor their land their water all of it at once and forever unquote this explicitly demonstrate how burials became a marker of territorial sovereignty for the community conceptualized as a form of stone the burial stone they function as a material memory moreover graveyard then stands as an icon of sacred relationship between the pioneer and the territory dismantling the dual cartesian understanding of nature and culture divide for adivasi landscape constitute memory and inherits from it makes the claim of now it allows the community to use graveyard to objectifying pioneering clans and legitimizing their land possession now moving on from 19th century to what's happening since 2017 more uh, recently but it has been happening since 1992 there's an ongoing movement in india which has been sabotaged at the moment called pathalgari where indigenous people deploy burial stones or use burial stone and erect them right at the entrance of their villages by inscribing parts of indian constitutions that guarantee them right and safeguard their rights to forest um the reason i studied this is because my project looked at how people in everyday how do they make sense of everyday memory uh, as a way of making claims to the state in relation to their um forest um and it's in and there's a quote which is very interesting from 19th century and i'll quickly come to here where uh another missionary was noted saying they the spirit dwell in the hearts of the nearest relative in streams in rivulets in tanks in ponds in rocks in forest in fields in fire in water in rain in rivers and in burial in mountains in their village and the spirit the lord of all of them the bonga which is the spirit figure within indigenous community is explicitly declared to be everywhere and seen everything i haven't seen it i don't know where they're seeing according to mundas sense perception is the only bar between us and them it's always almost confounding for me to know where that bar is how can we testify it who is going to bring that to court i'm confused bongas are 
those living beings which though firmly believed as existing and influencing us for good or evil can neither be seen nor be perceived nor can be touched or heard those fluttering about everywhere they are so far sense perception goes they as if they were not this suggests something very serious and is imprinted today in ongoing environmental protest not necessarily using the language of climate change but underpin all ongoing concerns of ecological extraction this suggests that the conceptual world within the indigenous community and in community elsewhere um, ordinarily cannot be possibly rendered through the division that we use between human nature and spirit the spirit co constitute the life world of indigenous this raises an important question about restricted imagination that we often deploy emerging from anthropocentric definitions of culture it not only explains the culture from the world view of human beings but also separates very conveniently from the environment nature spirit all of which co constitute the very meaning of these terms within the cosmology of indigenous people where jal jungle and zameen constitute the live life world of the community it is erroneous to draw such binaries for any argument the word the word pathal gari for instance has roots in pathal meaning stone gari means insta- installation it depicts a process through which pe- um, people make legal claim by using memory as a register of protest the stone slabs turned into a form of political consciousness with big stone um big stone plaque being erected outside across charkhand from 2019 until recently the plaque bore excerpts from various pieces of legislation haphazardly put together under an umbrella term of constitution together this came to be locally known as the pathalgari movement soon after it became a popular attention grabbed popular attention through extensive dissemination of information especially through social media the name of birsa munda who was the 19th century anti colonial hero was brought back to the scene the movement had introduced and i find it the most interesting part that instead of choosing anything that they could have they chose a language that doesn't really actually exist but was deployed strategically to send moral panic to the state so if you would read i can't even read from here but this non judicial area uh, right in the middle and this was deployed as a strategy to send moral panic to the state to claim that a certain territory belongs primarily to the indigenous community within the area just to wrap <laughs> i'm trying to what i'm trying to say is that uh, as we go on de- developing vocabulary around anthropocene holocene memory is a tool of environmental justice subaltern memory then the group that has been sub- sabotaged historically is a site of ecological protest for me because it deploys affective register subaltern memory constitute and contest institutionally governed and popular images of the past it contains disruptive potential to resist the official history that creates and maintains the unity and continuity of political institution adivasis use symbolic sites such as pathalgari to articulate nonetheless their political consciousness about the longer duty of exhaustion extraction and ecological dispossession in fact the cultural romanticism about indigenous peoples specifically in charkhand which portrays them as nature loving isolated unruly both in the popular imaginary cast by various racialized stereotype and political campaigning is in absolute remarkable dissonance to their live realities in fact contrary to this assailable portrayal of their lives adivasis regularly stake their claims using the language of both state as well as language of the constitution um in staking their claim finally last word they flatten the most primal thrust of indian modernity project which is actually sustained on the projection of their backwardness thank you Sorry, I'm Shreya Chatterjee uh, at the, from the Paul Mallon Center, and uh, thank you so much to all all three of you for really brilliant presentations. I'm still working through your amazing presentation, Rahul. So my question is for the first one, and I have plenty of questions for you <laughs> as well uh, later. Um, I was really struck by the use of um, 
you know, you're working on in two modes, um, Eileen and Elias, and I was really curious um, about how you balance the two in your work. Um, and so what I'm thinking about, wh one is kind of artwork as evidence, the photograph as evidence, and thinking about, you know, sort of violence by the KFS, uh, burning of houses and things like this are kind of really tangible. But on the other hand, you have the speculative market and the financialization of nature. Uh, and I think it is in your work, Aline, that you can do the kind of moving back and forth between the two. Uh, and I'm really curious about sort of method and, and how, how you do that and what you also see as the kind of benefit of the arts in some sense of being able to do that and how that kind of also maybe feeds into, um, for the lack of a better word, activist structures. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Um, yeah, where to start? I think there is something, I, I think I'm, I'm, I just hopelessly kind of believe in storytelling, if I can say it that simply. Uh, and I think that when it comes to these kind of speculative market processes, to try and find uh, not only stories, but when they are so invisible as they actually are, uh, to also try and pin them down to something that we can look or, yeah, feel. Um, yeah, see or feel. Um, and when it comes to this question around how it relates to, um, yeah, can you, can you repeat the rest of the question, actually? <laughs> How some you know using the images or using kind of something you see or feel in a larger in the larger context of carbon markets, etc. How that feeds into um, some of the work you do, Elias, as well, right? Or um, just kind of broader um, activist structures, or you know what happens next after you make the work, yeah. or while you're making the work. <laughs> yeah. Uh, do you have something to say about this? Maybe. Yeah, uh, maybe uh, the work we collaborate with Eileen is that uh, uh, using those images because as community we tend to, we do not actually understand about this um, carbon credits and how it works. But now supplementing to because ours is just like art photos. Uh, that we build on chronological events in order to show the proof of long time evictions of uh, trees mm -hmm. that now Eileen comes in to to show this commodification of trees mm -hmm. using using pictures and camera that works around mm -hmm. and the value where uh, the value in trees of carbon they say so that are using to affect us, and that is our like in the connection between our work to facilitate like and and the pattern to Aileen and uh, uh, joining it together, and then show people how how these things just uh, renders like makes commodification of something that people have get for centuries. Yes. Anything? Yeah, I think in the in this project, both of our perspectives in that way maybe is really necessary. I mean, I think I couldn't make this work without you, obviously. Like that, um, yeah, that is really a, a collaboration in that way because that perspective is entirely necessary to get the point across, uh, and that is perspective I don't sit with. Um, yeah. Thank you so much. Really, two fascinating uh, presentations. Um, my, I have a question for for Rahul. I really loved your your talk. Sorry, I'm here. <laughs> and um, I really found it fascinating how the the community was actually making a claim towards um, 
authorities, local authorities, right, the state as an institution, by trying to disrupt uh, the legal arguments invoking affect memories that actually do not register as such in the traditional legal language. But at the same time, they were relying on constitutional rights, right? So I found this tension, this paradox really, really fascinating. And I wanted to hear more from you how um, local authorities, how the state has responded to these, uh, these legal claims. If, if it has changed their configuration, their understanding, perhaps even the definition of these legal categories, or if it has just washed over them and they fell back into the sort of enclosure of pre-existing models of constitutional rights. And very briefly, I wasn't sure if you were regretting that the Anthropocene Working Group did not recognize the Anthropocene as such, or if you were actually embracing it as something potentially um, opening, potentially good and welcoming. Thanks so much. No, I regretted it. <laughs> it was Friday when the email was sent. Um, no. <laughs> I guess in terms of... Uh, I don't know, in India we've had, and Ravi could speak actually much more than I, uh, we have a long history of environmental um, litigation that have embedded some of these safeguards within constitution. In this um, specific uh, protest, I think what was done in order to strategize and make it more seen to the state was to use the language of non-judicial area. So as it stands, there's no controversy between what was being laid out on these plaques, memorial plaques, but it was more about the method in which it kind of came out in public. But also, I guess, I don't know, and you, Marie, you, you, you're a legal scholar, you would know, but I feel like sometimes law also, especially in Indian context, uh, we don't have language to articulate these subnational grievances that may not fit within the language of law, because law, in my understanding as an anthropologist, is an assembly line, you know, it assembles, right? And whereas the memory is very flat and disruptive and it goes in many different ways. So law doesn't have capacity to contain some of what was being asked, but at the same time, knowing that the language in order to negotiate with the state, you will have to use constitution as a way to uh, ask for rights. So I think they very uh, strongly used constitution within the protest, but the outcome of that was not necessarily. But I was also fascinated, why would you choose burial stone in the age of social media where people are using I don't know what, but like, but th that's because in 19th century when these areas were suddenly turned into um, kind of law regimes, uh, indigenous people were lifting burial stone and walking down 500 kilometers from Jharkhand to Calcutta High Court mm -hmm. to say, listen, like, we don't have paper, but here is my ancestor's burial stone that makes claim of where we come from. Uh, so I guess it's also, for me, interesting, as opposed to law, memory is very kind of flat and it's in continuum. It doesn't have linear process. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. Can Thanks. I just, can I just ask a very quick question? How, how do we reconcile that? How, how do we reconcile that space? How do we? How do we? How do you? I mean, because therein lies a huge fault line. Yeah. Around two very particular and you know powerful cases, if you like, legitimate ones. I mean, Indian Constitution has over the many years since, and we're not a very we're a very recent country, right? Like it's been seventy five years since we have become independent, and it's explosively diverse. So, I mean, the challenge is not unitary, that there is a community and there is a set, yeah. I think, I think over the year, you know, through various legislation, and I think including PESA, you know, which actually authorizes local authority to have self-rule in certain capacity. Uh, but it's an emergent problem because, um, um, I find it a productive tension. I don't necessarily think they clash enough not to coexist, otherwise we would have fallen apart, um, given how explosively diverse we are. But I guess I guess it will stay. It stayed when British was there. It stays when we are independent as a country. I don't have, yeah, an answer. Yeah. Uh, I just add to that the law is also in play. The Supreme Court has interpreted the law in various ways, especially in this. So. Uh, though it's, it is sort of cut and dry, but still it is not in, in many ways. Uh, is there a question here? Yeah, hi. Um, uh, 
for uh, Elias and all the panel and everyone present. Um, I had the honor of meeting uh, Ungugi, one of, uh, one of uh, Kenyan's uh, um, writers, activist writers, and um, at the time I think he had just wrote, written his first book in, in his indigenous language first before he wrote a book in any other language. And, and so I was interested in, in learning from you what the role of language is uh, within uh, the struggle um, and, and perhaps in terms of your activism, etc. Thanks. Yeah, the uh, role of language plays major is a significant role in 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 in, uh, in a land rights struggle because all these conservation laws are colonial imposed whereby like if we use our language we don't say forest is those are people's lands but if you turn it to into the language like col British colonial language, it becomes something else that separates communities from the forest. We say it is our land because it, despite being a forest and uh, critically, language is important. Because what they did was like, uh, like okay, okay, they did not recognize people's language. That is language and identity causes together. Therefore, they don't recognize right to the forest is, yes. Thanks. Online question. Sorry. <laughs> one or two. Oh, just one. Okay. One. Um, the person writes, Raul, thanks for your talk. Does the caste system system still impact much in India? Also, can you say a little more about how people use state language to fight oppression? Can you elaborate on the dominant discourse and the kickback? Is anyone in India writing songs in everyday language as part of the fight? That last question is for Aline and Elias too. That's, that's a lecture. That is a lecture. <laughs> Perhaps respond to part of it. Yeah, I mean, there is a conceptual difference between caste system and racialization of indigenous people. And it's not, um, I shouldn't say it's not very strict in the way it operates. Uh, because the violence is interposed in, in both ways. So racialization as well as caste order. And I think it does definitely inform ways in which states respond to territorial demands made by indigenous people across the country um, in the way, yeah, I guess it's, it's yeah. I don't know, I don't, I feel the movement that, and the questions that indigenous people ask in India, um, I know it's controversial to say, but it has a different claim making process and are often about, um, it underpins some of the territorial control question than representation, which is the question that, let's say, Dalits um, ask within the historiography. So the historiography makes it clear that indigenous people's uh, questions are underpinned in um, control of the natural resources rather than representation within the political system. Um, but I guess violence is, of course, widespread. Yeah. People still write songs. It will address to the both both of you. <laughs> or you want to say all three of you songs? Yes. Yeah. Oh, protest. About protest. Oh, okay. Against extraction. <laughs> or whatever. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, I think they do, but anyway. <laughs> So uh, thank you very much, uh, all my dear panelists, and thank you everybody for listening. There's a coffee break now. Okay, thank you.